Welcome to Youth Voices of Greater Cincinnati. I'm Dylan Horsley. And I'm Kaylin Stacy. And today we're interviewing a mental health expert, Mr. Glenn. Thank you for coming. Thank you for asking. Uh, you why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? My name is Mike Glenn. I'm Vice President of Business Development for the Leonard Center of Hope, uh, located in Mason, Ohio. We're one of the leading mental health care centers in the entire country. We've served patients from all 50 states, including 10 countries from around the world, Australia and Asia. Uh, my role is to focus on education and awareness. Um, there's three areas of focus. I focus on schools, businesses, and elected officials. Uh, my job is to promote mental health care uh, awareness, education, and to help people understand what kind of services are out there and help them understand uh, what resources are available when they need help. Is there a preferred population for you? Do you work with youth, adults, or both? At the Leonard Center, we work with, with all ages. Um, there, there's not really a preferred population. Uh, our, our mission is to provide high quality patient care for, for all age levels. Um, what we're known for is our uh, diagnostic uh, assessments, meaning when someone's dealing with a mental illness, uh, a lot of times um, it's, it's challenging to diagnose exactly uh, what they have. And they've been through lots of different treatments. Um, they've seen a lot of different people. And what we're able to do very well is uh, diagnose exactly what they have and then provide recommendations of what their treatments should be. What are some ways you could diagnose people? Like, well, I'm not uh, in a position uh, to um, be able to uh, give much details on that uh, with business development, but I can tell you um, how we do treat our patients. Uh, it's either through individual therapies uh, or a group therapy uh, uh, type of setting. Uh, we also treat our patients uh, with medicine to help control uh, their symptoms. And also we have what's called ECT and TMS. And both of those treatments um, deal with stimulating the brain uh, with either electrical or magnetic uh, pulses. And um, that has proven very effective, uh, especially with people that are suffering from depression. Do you have different types of group settings for different diagnoses? Diagno Diagnoses? Yeah. Yeah, we have, um, we have different levels of programming. Um, there's what's called uh, inpatient care, where someone's actually admitted to the hospital. And you know their average stay is usually six to seven days. And then we have outpatient care, uh, where what's involved with that is someone will see one of our our clinicians maybe for a half an hour session or an hour session but, but sometimes people need something in between they don't need to be in a hospital full time but seeing somebody once a week or once a month is not quite enough so we have these different group sessions um, one of is called partial hospitalization program and then another one is uh, intensive outpatient uh, program where someone might come to our center uh, five days a week from like eight to three o'clock. So they're staying at our center uh, throughout the day, but they get to go home at night. And then we have other programs, um, the like inpatient, or I'm sorry, um, intensive outpatient, same idea where they're only coming to the center for you know a couple hours a day. When you work with people, how do you mainly touch out to teenagers or people of that population? So my, my role with business development, uh, I, like I said earlier, I focus on schools, businesses, and elected officials. And so for the, for the schools, um, my, my focus is to uh, get in front of different school districts uh, different different boards and try to help promote mental health awareness and education. There are several nonprofits in Greater Cincinnati 
that, uh, that focus on schools. Uh, one of them is uh, one in five. Another one is Grant Us Hope. Uh, both those uh, nonprofit organizations are getting in front of schools and helping them with uh, that education and helping them with uh, providing a, a curriculum on what to teach kids uh, at, at, a, at a younger age, which is really important because 50% uh, of the time when someone is going to experience a mental illness, it occurs by age 14, 75% by the age 24. And so it's important to uh, teach kids, uh, especially around your age uh, in middle school, because those are the times when kids are going through all their transitions emotionally, physically, socially, and so th that's a critical uh, time in someone's life. And so um, it's really important to, to educate uh, students you know, like yourself so you know um, how to cope um, as you're dealing with different things that come up in your life and so that you have an understanding of what resources are available. What levels or types of education would you have to go through to become um, someone working in someone the mental health field. Someone working in the mental health field. Sure. Uh, as far as education, it's it's going to vary depending on uh, uh, what type of discipline you go into within the mental health field. Um, we have uh, psychologists, uh, psychiatrists, social workers, nurses, and then also in the mental health field, it's a business just like um, any other where you have to have uh, other disciplines, uh, such as marketing, which of course promotes what we do and lets everybody know about our programs and our services. Uh, we need professionals like in accounting, um, that's making sure that we're on budget. And uh, we have uh, you know, HR positions uh, to, that handles benefits and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then oh, positions like mine, business development, where I'm out there helping with education and awareness. So as far as the, the type of education, um, some of our uh, staff have um, bachelor's degrees, some master's degrees, and then some their, their doctor's degrees. What are some unexpected problems that go along with mental health issues? Are there any side effects or anything, would you just call it? Do you mean specifically for, for the patients? Like, Patient, yeah. Like what, um, what type of challenges yes. the patients have? So, uh, with with mental illness, you know, it, it it affects your ability to, you know, make decisions. Um, simple things that uh, that we take for granted every day, uh, and being able to function, it impacts um, their behavior. And um, people that aren't experiencing mental illness. You know, they have the ability to um, um, make appropriate decisions, uh, carry out them, you know, carry themselves in, in an appropriate way. Um, uh, with with mental illness, it can impact, you know, how they behave. So that can hurt their ability to uh, find a job and be able to sustain a job. Um, it can affect their their social their social life and how they interact with um, with friends and family. So it has a lot of different impacts on an individual. What inspired you to follow this path you, into your line of work? <laughs> so I have an interesting career. Uh, my first 22 years was spent in engineering and construction. Uh, I have both a bachelor's and a master's degree in engineering. And uh, the reason that um, I decided uh, after, like I said, 22 years in this profession to change careers and focus on mental health is because my family was impacted, uh, specifically my, my father. And so I, I understand uh, how much uh, mental illness impacts an individual and how devastating that can be to that person and, and their friends and family. And so um, over the last four years, I got involved with the Lunar Center of Hope uh, through various ways, uh, with helping with our fundraising. And um, I also was involved um, uh, on, their, on their board. 
uh, which is just a board, it's just a, a group of people that that help make sure that the company, uh, in this case the Linder Center, is is heading in the right direction uh, with their operations. And I, I made the decision that this is what I want to do. I'm extremely passionate about um, uh, mental health and, and creating awareness and education for our community. Um, and so I, I made that decision. And so f about five months ago, I started uh, working there, and uh, it's been it's been really great. It's been very fulfilling. Once you get into your job and you get the job, is there still more training after that that you would have to go through? Yeah, just like most uh, pr uh, professional services providers, such as engineers, accountants, uh, lawyers, uh, in 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 healthcare, it's the same way. Uh, we have we have to have continuing uh, education credits, um, especially in healthcare. Um, things are constantly changing. There's there's research that's taking place. We're learning new things all the time uh, when it comes to in, in healthcare in general, and and so in order for our clinicians to know. Uh, the latest and greatest information so they can take care of their patients in the in the most um, optimum way they have to keep up on education and so yes there's there's ongoing training that has to take place year after year are there times where you um, emotionally get attached to people you are working with or yes I, I I'm sure our, our clinicians at times it can it can be it can be tough to separate you know themselves from the patient and 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 their work, um, you know, the, the, these people that are struggling with a mental illness, they're they're sharing very deep personal things with our clinicians, and and um, I'm sure at times it's hard for our clinicians to to separate that and not get attached. Um, it's it's very emotional. Um, these the. These patients, you know, like I said, they really open up about their personal lives, and so I'm, I'm sure at times it's it's hard for clinicians, even for myself, even though I'm I'm not working with, um, you know, with with patients uh, on a regular basis. Um, just being in this field, uh, it's sometimes it is it is hard, and uh, it it even impacts me at times when I hear. Um, uh, people that are struggling or or they have family members that are struggling because I understand what that's like. Earlier you brought up research and learning. What mm -hmm. other, what types of new research or learning have you been researching? <laughs> yeah, so at the, at the Linder Center uh, we have a research institute uh, we've done a, a lot of research, when, especially when it comes to uh, bipolar disorder. Uh, what we're learning um, is that how much uh, mental illness is tied to genetics. Uh, we're hoping in, in, in years to come that at some point someone will be able to get a blood test and someone in a, in a doctor will be able to find out just from that blood test if someone is more susceptible to having a mental illness, which would be fantastic news because then someone can be proactive and, and getting ahead of it and, and um, getting to the right resources sooner and quicker. Because with, with mental illness, just like any other disease, the sooner that you detect it and start to get treatment for it, uh, the better your outcomes most likely are going to be. And so if, if someone knows that they're more susceptible to potentially having a mental illness, and um, having that awareness and education could, could, could make a huge difference in, in their quality of life if they're able to be proactive about it. So when you brought up blood testing, how would, what are some ways that researchers could do that? Is there different types of blood, like with stress levels or? Well, I, I'm not quite sure exactly um, how that would work. Um, you know, that, that's something that would take place in a lab, and um, honestly, I, I, I can't really answer that question. Um, but I know there are 
uh, ways um, that are being developed uh, and researched all the time is, as far as um, how to get feedback from a from, uh, blood sample you know, from, from their DNA. You brought up that mental illnesses could be hereditary. Mm -hmm. um, were there, sorry, were there other types of mental illnesses besides like bipolar? Are there just certain types that could be hereditary, or uh... that's part of the research? That's what we're tr that's part of what we're trying to figure out and try to understand. Um, there are others um, such as. Uh, schizophrenia and, and depression um, that we know of but um, yeah that's part of trying to figure it out what what we will be able to um, know from from someone's DNA as far as what what uh, mental illnesses they could potentially could have how do you uh, handle some of the challenges with the your clients is there any particular way you choose to handle them or you know, in, in our profession, it, it really comes down to having a empathy and really listening and understanding an individual's, uh, what their needs are. Um, with, in, in, in mental health, it, it's, um, it's different than physical health because it, it can be ambiguous. It, it's not as, um, as, as clear as to what, um, uh, someone's diagnosis is and what the proper treatment is. Uh, the biggest thing that our profession can do is to be open-minded and, and be flexible. Uh, everyone's uh, treatment in their program and exactly what they need might be a little bit different from individual to individual. And so I think um, what's important is that our, our team is um, understanding, empathetic, uh, nimble and open-minded as far as how to treat somebody with a mental illness. Where did you go to school and train for your profession? For what I do? Yeah. So I'm originally from Wisconsin, so I'm a, I'm a Badger, and so I went to the University of Wisconsin and got my, actually a civil engineering degree, and then I went on and got a master's degree from Purdue University, and I started my career in engineering and uh, structural engineering, uh, to be exact, and uh, worked my way uh, in that field and eventually moved into more of a construction role. So um, if, you, if you guys are familiar with the Westchester Hospital, I was on the team that helped, helped build that a few years ago. And uh, through that process, uh, I, what I learned is that I really liked business development. I liked working with people, connecting with people, um, I like strategic planning. I like thinking long term. You know, where where is a business going, uh, not just where it is today. And by developing this network across Greater Cincinnati and being involved with different leadership programs, um, it has really helped me uh, with the transition into what I do today for um, for mental health awareness and education. Um, you might have heard the saying, it's, it's uh, who you know, not what you know. Um, and I would encourage you, by the way, uh, as, as you get older, to, um, to connect with people. It's uh, very important, um, it'll help with your careers. But I've been able to use, to use that, um, that experience um, uh, to, my, to my benefit to be able to connect with people, reach out with them, be able to set up meetings. Uh, for example, the reason I'm here today uh, work, talking with you is it's through my network of, of people that I know um, that thought that I could help you out with, uh, with, this, um, uh, with this interview session. So um, anyway, that's uh, how I got, that was my experience with in, in, in the education that I have that it's helped me with what I'm doing now. Before you uh, switch careers, is there anybody you ever talked to with or met without mental health issues? Yeah, so uh, I have my own personal kind of board of directors. I, I have my own group of people that I talk to uh, throughout my career uh, whenever I need help or I need advice. One thing uh, that I've learned um, is that you, you can't do everything by yourself. 
uh, there, there are people out there that have great experiences, that have, that have great input that I, that I can learn from. And so when I was thinking of making the transition, I reached out to them. I, I asked them what they thought, and what most of, what pretty much everyone told me is that you know you follow, follow your heart, follow your passion, uh, because then it doesn't become so much. It's not a job. Uh, I wake up uh, every day excited to go to work because I, I know that I'm uh, helping make you know a difference for people. And it's that's very gratifying and um, very fulfilling. How did you prepare yourself to succeed, or prepare yourself to go from one line of work to a completely different line of work? Well, I did it very slowly. It wasn't something I did all of a sudden. Um, the way I did it uh, is that I I got involved with the Linder Center of Hope about four years ago uh, by by uh, helping uh, volunteer with our Touchdown for Hope uh, fundraiser, which is our annual fundraiser that um, we use to help generate uh, uh, funding for our research. And I got to know people. I, I asked a lot of questions. I did a lot of uh, research and reading myself and got to know uh, the mental health field. Uh, I connected with a lot of people. And then I also helped with what's called our Community Education Day. It's a biannual event that we do uh, to help uh, educate uh, the community. And so I volunteered on that committee and helping get that ready. And then uh, I also uh, spent about a year and a half on the board. And by doing that, I understood the, um, got to understand the financial side of the Linder Center of Mental Health, like the business side of it. And so over the course of four years, um, by getting involved, by meeting people, by asking questions, uh, doing lots of reading, lots of research, uh, that's how I was able to prepare myself uh, to make that transition. What are some of the greatest challenges you faced in the coming the field? Some of the uh, greatest challenges in general when it comes to mental health is, is stigma. And uh, with mental health, what, what I have learned is that people don't, that people don't want to talk about it. People don't want to share you know, when they're struggling uh, with, a, with a particular issue. And so that, that's a challenge that I have to, I have to face uh, every day. As I'm out there trying to change that, I'm trying to change how our community views mental health. Uh, trying to change uh, how how people um, uh, perceive it, and and that that we're that we're all impacted, all impacted by it to some level. And so that that by far is is my biggest challenge. And. It, it's it's t uh, tough in mental health because that that's an ongoing thing day after day. But uh, we've seen a lot of good changes in the last few years. People are talking about it a lot, a lot more. The fact that you asked me to come in here today and, and meet with you and talk about mental health, I think is fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, I have more of these types of things with other school districts uh, around the community. But yeah, that's by far uh, the biggest challenge I have. You said that some people had trouble opening up and talking about their bigger problems. Would you say that people with certain mental illnesses had tr more trouble opening up than people with other illnesses? Yes, I, I, I think that depending on what type of illness you have, it, it can make a difference in how willing you're able to, to talk about it. I think um, it seems like people can t tend to be more open to, in talking about things like anxiety or depression. But it, when it comes to other illnesses like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or some of these other ones, um, those tend to be um, harder for people to talk about, um, and I, I think all that comes down to is just um, education. If if we, uh, and it goes back to what we talked about earlier, the importance of educating our youth, 
you know, starting in grade school and middle school and high school. Um, if, if, if we have those kind of dialogues and discussion, by, by the time our, our youth are older and adults, they don't know any different. They've been talking about mental illness, you know, their whole life, just like math or gym or reading or any of the other classes you take. Uh, but yeah, I think um, I think what it comes down to is is education. As people uh, understand it more, they're not as uh, scared to talk about it, um, not afraid, um, and they'll have a better understanding of what it is and how to how to treat it. So I think it comes down to that. When you bring up uh, bringing mental health issues to the everyday school life, what were some ways you could teach people when you bring it to the curriculum? Well, just like uh, any other discipline, take reading, for example. Um, you know, when you're in preschool and kindergarten, you're obviously, you're not reading a, a full book. You know, you start out learning the ABCs, and then you start learning about words, and you start learning about putting sentences together, and then you learn about you know, an entire paragraph, and you work your way up to all of a sudden now you're reading chapter books. Well, the same the same concept is going to apply when it comes to mental health. Uh, we're going to start with basic concepts such as you're feeling sad, you're feeling mad, you're feeling uh, anxious, you're worried about something, and we're going to talk about how 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 would you cope with that? There are there are um, uh, obviously there's different ways to express your anger, let's say, if you're upset. Some ways are, are better than others. And so it's just starting to teach kids, you know, how, how, to, um, how to handle certain things, give them, giving, give them coping skills, also teaching kids where can they go to get help if something doesn't, if something's not right. You know, it, um, whether it's a parent or a teacher or maybe it's the, the school nurse. Just knowing that those resources are available, I think will help help children, you know, as they're thinking that, you know, maybe they're dealing with something and they're not sure what to do. But anyway, it's 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 a uh, it's a uh, a progression that that makes sense for uh, its age appropriate uh, concepts and materials as as the child grows from from you know grade school to middle school to high school. You brought up coping. I was just wondering if there were, what were the different types of coping methods and are there some that would work better for some illnesses rather than others? Great question. Um, in and it's it it uh, it's, it obviously it varies depending on the situation and, and what the what the child is experiencing. I guess what I mean with with coping is you know when something, for example, you know if a, if a if a child is uh, um, let's say they get a, a they do um, they struggle on a test and they do really poorly on the test. You know, just helping them understand how they can get help, how they can go talk to the teacher. Um, there's an understanding that we all have tough days. We all, you know, once in a while we're going to have, we might have a, uh, a bad test. We don't do so well. But understanding that it's okay. There's people that, that can help them. You know, whether it's um, some extra time, you know, after school or, or a tutor or, um, getting getting that help and how to deal with that um, versus that it's that it's the end of the world that that um, that uh, getting this uh, bad uh, test grade you know is gonna really really hurt them or whatever so it's just understanding how to cope with something challenging that comes up um, and realizing that you know there are resources available what are some ways you prepare for like different age groups? Is there any kind of different treatments, I guess you could say, or how you reach out to them? As far as the details of treatments for, for kids, I, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to, to answer that question. Um, just based, you know, I'm not in that uh, um, position to describe the treatments in detail uh, when it comes to, 
to kids? Uh, that that would be a great question for our, one of our psychologists or psychiatrists that that work with our adolescents on our on a regular basis. Is there yeah. any other important things that you think people should know? Well, we we've covered a, a lot of ground uh, today. Um, we've covered a lot of different topics. Uh, the the one thing that I'll stress is that. Uh, we, we, we can fight stigma with education and awareness. Uh, I'd like to in encourage people to, to get the help when they, when they need it. Unfortunately, the average person will wait eight to 10 years uh, after first seeing signs or symptoms of mental illness before they get help. I mean, can you imagine if you were, let's say you, you hurt your leg, let's say you, you fell down the stairs and you hurt your leg and you waited 10 years to get help, you, that doesn't make sense, right? So, you know, uh, uh, the thing I wanna leave with is, is that, you know, the earlier someone gets help for their mental illness, uh, the better chances of them having, having better outcomes um, and which will impact their quality of life. And the other thing is that um, in, in this country, one in five people will suffer from a mental illness. So my, what I want to stress is that people that are suffering are not alone. There's about 60 mil, 61 million Americans that are suffering from mental illness. And so they're not alone. There's treatment. And the earlier they get it, the better. So. Well, I think that's all the questions we have for now. Well, I thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Um, I'm uh, grateful for your interest in, in mental health. Hopefully I was helpful and, and uh, provided um, some inf information for you today that you can share with your other students in your class and also you know, your classmates throughout the school. Thank you uh, for watching the show, and thank you again, Mr. Glenn, for coming and talking to us about mental health. Very glad to be here. Thanks for this opportunity. Again, uh, I'm uh, grateful for your interest in mental health, and uh, please spread the word to your fellow classmates um, the importance of um, getting help if they need it.